what's happening is the world is going to a different paradigm shift. The other thing that I'd like to say is that what is needed for a smart economy, right? So and first, let's discuss what's needed for a smart economy, and then we'll say, okay, where are we in Bangladesh, and how do women become investable? That's all we're solving for, right? So smart economy needs, means digital inclusion, obviously, so everybody has to have an access to device and connectivity. And it has to be affordable. That's the piece that most of us don't focus on. A woman cannot afford a smartphone, then she cannot access any device. And, and she cannot access any information that needs data. So if you're doing f-commerce, you are a woman who has access to data, right? But how many of those do we have? If you look at the bottom of the pyramid, most of them are not even doing f-commerce. They're taking microfinance loans for up as much as 40% interest, and they're doing their business month to month, and uh, they are always in debt. So that's one thing we need to solve for, right? The women at the bottom of the pyramid who are taking loans at very high interest rate. Just for the audience, the non-performing loan ratio of microfinance with 40, up to 40% interest rate is probably 1%. Whereas the non-performing loan ratio of a commercial bank where the rich and the famous are catered is nine plus percent. So there's something here we're missing. There's something here that needs to be addressed that wha what happens if you suddenly half the interest rate of these people who live month to month? There's going to be more money coming into the economy and the economy will grow. Our GDP will probably move up a few points just with this disposable income if you half the interest rate of the microfinance. The other thing that's very important is financial inclusion. We know that we have the unbanked and the underbanked. They're not ready. So if you do not have digital inclusion and if you do not have financial inclusion, how are you going to be part of a smart economy? Smart economy implies that you are innovative, you're tech-driven, and you will drive change and you will disrupt and create a transformative impact. That's where the main idea is of a smart economy. So currently, we have 40 million students in the country, but the demand and the supply side are very lopsided. We have many students and few jobs. I saw someone at North South University the other day, the best private university in Bangladesh, working for Starbucks. Not Starbucks, I'm sorry, what is it called? The, the local one? North End, yes, thank you so much. I saw the, and then I, I asked him, I was so impressed by his attitude, the way he served, the way he spoke English, that where did you go to school? And, and he said North South University. It actually broke my heart. Because a lot of people send their children to North South from the villages selling every property they have, thinking that this child will get a good education and provide for the family. But we are not able to cater to the needs of the masses. Now let's look at women. Women are, are mostly, I would say, that women in this room, including me, we are very risk averse. We do not jump to become an entrepreneur. We want those high paying, uh, sophisticated jobs where there's no risk, you get your big, big fat paycheck. I did that too, right? But the, the poor women in our country are risk takers. The bottom of the pyramid, the marginalized, they are risk takers. If they are risk takers, what are we doing to serve them? What are, how are we empowering them? How are we um, you know, making them interested to embrace technology? And technology for all of you in this room, because just because I'm a tech person, I will tell you that technology is just an enabler. Technology is not rocket science. You do not need to know anything about technology to use it in your business. So whatever your business is, technology can go underneath and make it grow. What is the difference between the women that are in CSMEs, the cottage micro small entrepreneurs, and a startup woman that I would fund? One word, and that is scale. What helps you scale? Technology. So this is where we are going to, we are going to spend a lot of time in saying, it's women's participation and how to make them investable. So we have um, a startup called Hishab Plus. The founder happens to be just walking in right now. And you know what their opening line was? They won an award and uh, they got a big um, in investment. It's like providing women who have no phone a digital financial footprint with the aim of making them debt-free and bankable. 
How do you do that? Well, it's very easy. We have demographic dividend, 50% are youth. Let's go for assisted technology. Each one, teach one. Imagine if you pair an intern of a university with a micro uh, finance business lady and say the intern has to do an internship. We, we are doing that actually. You pair them up, she learns business, and she learns how to do the accounting, but she enters all the data for her. So when you go to a bank with lots of these handwritten papers, there's, a bank is not going to take you seriously. How do you become bankable? It's a 23-page KYC document you have to fill. So what we're doing is we're building in alternative credit scores. We're saying that let's give these women access through assisted technology. And these women are very smart. They are doing business. But in order to be investable, we need to make them debt-free. We need to make them scale. And the most important thing is that we need to teach them fear is not a motivator. Fear should not be a motivator. I, if I ask in this audience how many of you were scared of math in school, I'm sure a lot of people will raise their hands. It, math, science, physics, was fear, right? But it, it should not be. The world has changed. People say, how will I make my website? I'm like, you don't have to make your own website. And they will, some people say, I cannot afford a website. There's no code coming up right now in the world where you just, it's done for you. You just go and do it. it is, but people need to know about it, and that's what we need to do. We as women, especially in this room, need to reach out to the masses and explain to them how you leverage technology, what are you doing. No one has ever taken interest. And they are the women we need to help because who contributes to the GDP of our country? It's really the informal economy. Informal economy of women, of course there are men, but I'm focusing on the 30 million MFI borrowers. How do you change that scene? How do you make them debt free? It is not, it's a spiral. We need to work on that. And the interest rate is so high. What Professor Yunus did in the 1970s was Remarkable, he opened an access to finance for women. But it's been 50 years, we need to graduate. We need to change from lending to investing. That's what I do for my profession. Whenever I see that we have a woman borrower, we, we look at her credentials and we see, okay, we can help her make her business bigger and make her scale, get a little bit of technology in and make her grow faster. So that's one of the main things that I want to highlight today. If you leave this room, please remember one thought, that women in Bangladesh are very courageous, especially the marginalized, and they're the majority. We are not Bangladesh in this room. These women are taking loans to do business. Our job is to empower them with technology, make them debt-free, and make them investable so that they become contributors to a very smart economy. Um, there are a few challenges we have to overcome with the smart economy, which is a, a research done by the International Telecommunication um, Platform, where they say that it is um, the, the, the access to internet, like there's approximately eight billion people in the world. Will you believe it that four billion have no access to data? How do you become a smart economy if you do not have access to data? They have said that the price of data in a developed or a least developed country is 8x in, than that of price of data in a um, very developed economy, right? So the US and UK versus Bangladesh and Sri, uh, Nepal and Sri Lanka. So our, what is the incentive for our people to pay for data? That's what I ask. We always say, let's give them training, you give them certificates, What's after that? It's really about making a change. That woman has to be inspired. She has to see the dream of being able to do something with technology to contribute to a smart economy. And the customer has to be willing to pay for that service. With our GDP, even a beggar can afford a dollar a month. That's $12 times 160 million people. There you have your half a billion dollar revenue. But are we solving the problems of the masses? We are not. We are very interested in solving various, offering sophisticated solutions and saying, hey, Mr. Problem, come and find me. 
That's not what we need to do. So I think it's time we've learned that we will now focus on women and see how we can uplift them. I've started the journey myself. I would like to encourage all of you to come help me because it's an endeavor we need to take as a team. It's an, the each one teach one where the youth learn business, where the women learn how to do their accounting, not themselves. As soon as you've given them a financial digital footprint, they are bankable because our footprint, a software has the alternative credit score built in. So you, we know when she's lending, how much she's selling at, is she profitable? Is she making a loss? How is she doing her business? They don't know anything. They live month to month. And they are the main contributors to our economy. In the interest of time, I'm not going to give a 25-minute speech and uh, get you all um, sleepy. But I would just say that the four things that are important that has been globally studied that we need to have is the availability that I talked about. Not just availability. You can't just say, I have this and it's not affordable. It has to, availability and affordability go hand in hand, the two A's. They have to be affordable, not to you or me, but to the bottom of the pyramid. So that's one pair. And the other is it has to be of relevance, which I said, you solve an unmet and an unarticulated problem. Some people don't even know it's a problem. They think it's a way of life. It's our job. It's the job of the younger generation, the entrepreneurs, to look at their way of life and say, I can make this better. And how can we solve that? And last one is the readiness, right? Are we really digitally ready? We talk about smartphone and um, feature phone. The smartphone penetration is gradually increasing. But my mom has a smartphone. She only uses WhatsApp and Facebook. If I, if I ask her to order from Food Panda, she's like, I can't do it. Right? So there's some people, and then a lot of people have a smartphone just as a status symbol. The women we're talking about, the household has one phone. They share. The mother only uses the phone for calls. The children are on TikTok and YouTube. So a woman with no phone is what we're targeting. And you will see that if we, as a collective, drive that, we have enough people in this room who could invest. If we can make one bet here is like, how do we make these women investable and make them debt free because they have the business mindset. They have no education, no training. We have education, we have training. They have courage, we do not. We do not take risks generally. We all want, go, probably have gone to very good schools. So that's where the relevance factor comes in. Me with my degree in Silicon Valley, I'm trying to solve a problem from the tech perspective, but there's no relevance to the bottom of the pyramid. The users are not people in this room. And I will finally conclude with two points that I would like to make is that regarding the fourth industrial revolution, we all know it, I don't want to talk too much about it, but inclusion of women is a joint responsibility with men. And exclusion has joint risks. It's not about women losing jobs to men or men losing jobs to women. It's about men and women losing jobs to automation. So you, we need to unite, and that responsibility is a shared responsibility. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Sonia Mishir Kabir, for an exhilarating uh, keynote paper. Uh, you've very uh, succinctly put forward the premise that although women in Bangladesh are now in low value, low paying jobs in the formal sector, 37% of the workers in the formal sector are women, but they're at the bottom of the pyramid in the income scales. But there are far larger numbers of women in the informal economy of Bangladesh. And what we need to do is for them to jump from low paying, low value jobs to data and tech driven higher value employment or self-employment or entrepreneurship. And how are we going to do this? You know, Bangladesh is a country where we have, uh, we don't have very legacy, heavy technology issues. We often laugh and say that we are jumping from the first industrial revolution to the fourth industrial revolution without going through the second and third. And you know, with our women, we are going to do that. We are going to go from low paying, manufacturing and service sector jobs for our women to high value, high tech jobs, 
in the next decade or two decades. Before going to the very distinguished panel that I have here, I just want to give you a picture of what digital Bangladesh signifies. It has seen a significant transformation of the economy in terms of digitalization in 2022, and I'm giving this from a presentation made by our panel, the Bangladesh panel in LDC5 in Doha last week. In 2022, the number of unique mobile phone users in the country stood at 92.3 million. That is 55.9% of the population of the country. From just 19.1 million in 2006, the number of internet users is 50.7 million, 30.7% of the total population. The teledensity, voice plus internet subscription, has increased to 105.6%. Bangladesh has launched its first satellite in space in 2018. There are 28 high-tech parks, software technology parks, IT training and incubation centers across the country. The export of the ICT sector has apparently stands at 1.3 billion. Bangladesh ranks second in the online labor force, about 6.5 million freelancers. And there are 4,562 union digital center information technology-based telecenters. But of all these, I'm sure we all know that the percentage of women using these facilities are much lower than the percentage of men. Yet, more than 50% of the population in this country is women. We are not going to go very far with our growth story without including the women, and I think Sonia Vishir Kabir has given us uh, some very interesting suggestions of how to get the women included using data, using technology, and giving them digital financial inclusion opportunities. I will now go on to our esteemed panelists, and uh, the first panelist I would like to call upon, but let me first tell you who our panelists are here with us today. We have Ms. Rupali Haq Chaudhary, the Managing Director of Berger Paints Bangladesh Limited, and a former President of the Foreign Investors Chamber of Commerce and Industry. We have with us Ms. Rubaba Dola, the Country Managing Director of Oracle Bangladesh, Nepal, and Bhutan. Uh, she was a very familiar face to us from her Grameen phone days, I think, as well. And uh, we have Ms. Mantasha Ahmed, who is the President of the Association of Fashion Designers of Bangladesh, and she has also set up uh, the e-commerce platform called Deshi Bhalobashi. And I have to say, Mantasha, that I often log into that to see what's available there. Um, notwithstanding the fact that Sonia was um, not very keen on F-commerce, but at least it has got more than 300,000 of our women into the commercial space. And even if this platform changes, I think we will find alternative platforms. We have with us uh, Ms. Nicole Mao, the founder and CEO of Tiger New Energy. I, will go I would like to go to Ms. Rupali Haq Chaudhary first um, and ask her, from her uh, experience as, as the Managing Director of one of our very well-known um, companies, Berger, and her experience in FIKI, that how women entrepreneurs and workers can take advantage of Bangladesh's transition towards the digital economy, and what opportunities lie for them in Smart Bangladesh. Uh, may I just lay one ground uh, rule here? We don't have that many panelists, and we have some time, so instead of one intervention, I would like uh, two interventions from each of the panelists. So if you could uh, keep your interventions to three to four minutes each time. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, I was actually uh, listening to uh, Shonia because it's so interesting that she's completely talking about debt free. I mean, the traditional concept is actually you take the money from the bank and then you actually build the capacity, um, capital, do some business and show the transactions in the bank and they get the loan and you prosper. That's the traditional way of doing things. And what she has actually said is actually revolutionary. Uh, but in my experience is uh, said that the data says that out of that, you know, 70, 7 million uh, entrepreneurs, uh, only 7% are women. So the entrepreneurship of the woman, I mean, that is, is still on the very low side. I mean, that's actually, um, that's actually doesn't say uh, or speak about the ratio that we have 
uh, in terms of you know enrolling in the schools and universities. So. Uh, why they are not coming into the you know job area and why they are not pursuing any business that's a big question but i think uh, slowly slowly at the bottom of the pyramid they have shown us the path that's actually the glorious example they are not entrepreneur but they actually run the biggest export industry in the country that is the garments worker so that they constitute almost 2.2 how to actually uh, integrate a woman into this technology. I think uh, during um, COVID we have seen that, you know, the use of, uh, whether we like it or not, they use a lot of fi uh, Facebook uh, in order to, they have become, they became very creative. And from the household, some of the women they actually took the responsibility of the household when husbands lost their jobs. So I'm not saying that there is no one way of doing things. It, there are many way of actually, um, training these people, but our trainings are, you know, fragmented. What we're doing in the country, we are, we are doing, we are trying to actually, you know, train the people in, in a different platform. Everyone is trying different things. Now, my, our question is how to, you know, from the, create the pipeline, from the school, whether they should learn the coding, from the school, primary school, from the secondary school, so that the fear of, you know, that a STEM, science and technology, it's not there. You know, the people who are, for me, Amar Junno, this is a technology. The, com, using computer, it was a technology because it was developed after my, you know, birth and when I actually went to the uh, office, I started using Lotus 1, 2, 3. So there was a lot of fear. So basically, but the people who are born with the technology, for them, that's not a technology. For them, that's the way of life, like the television. You just put on the television. So they actually easily find out how to navigate a compu computer, how to na navigate a smartphone. And it becomes a very, very serious problem. So I'm, I'm, my point is that, you know, we have to actually train girls when they are in the school, when they are in the college, when they are in the university. So the fear factor is gone and they are ready to enter into either job or become an entrepreneur. So I think that's the way. We, we have to create the pipeline and we have to one platform. We are trying to do many things in different platforms and that's creating many confusions among us also. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rubadiba. You make a very good point. Um, I'm also one of these technologically challenged persons and I had to learn how to play Angry Bird from my four-year-old nephew. Uh, it was very embarrassing. But um, what you said at the end of your intervention, it's very interesting. We have schools all over the country now which have computer labs. In the villages, do you know what still happens with the computer labs? Students aren't allowed to touch the computers. You have 100 students in class nine and class 10. There are 12 computers. Teachers have to demonstrate, the headmaster's instructions are So this is a mindset that we need to come out of. Children who grow up with the technology use it very, very easily. Um, I will now uh, like to move on to Ms. Mantesha Ahmed. Uh, Mantesha, may I ask you, from your experience, how entrepreneurship training uh, to women can support Bangladesh's development aspirations? Uh, thank you, Ms. Kabir and Ms. Kabir. Um, March is a very significant month in the history of Bangladesh. 7th March is when uh, the father of the nation gave his historic speech and that led, to, led our people to fight till the end and win the war. Uh, 8 March is International Women's Day. Uh, 17th March is Bangabundu's birthday and also Children's Day. And 26th March is uh, our Independence Day. And today is actually even extra special for me because today is my daughter's birthday. And Happy birthday. thank you. And my daughter, uh, this child, she doesn't differentiate between a car and a doll. To her, uh, a car and a doll, they're both toys that children should play with. Uh, so anyway, as a, as a representative of the fashion industry, uh, I try to give you a picture of the current scenario and the investment opportunities in this sector. So, uh, sorry, excuse me. Uh, 
Um, it's important to understand that uh, language, culture, festivals is a very integral part of our lifestyle in Bangladesh. Um, and there's a saying in Bangla, Baro Mashe Taro Parbon, uh, which means 13 occasions for 12 months. In fact, we have much more than 13 occasions throughout the year, and the fashion industry takes full advantage of that. Um, 60%, more than 60% of our annual in inventory in this uh, industry is targeted towards Boishak and Eid uh, alone. So when COVID lockdown started uh, in May, uh, March 2020, uh, most of our entrepreneurs, weavers, artisans, they had already prepared their inventory for these two festivals. Uh, and they were stuck with a large inventory and they didn't know what to do with it. And uh, then after a series of meetings with our members and uh, directors, uh, we came up with the Deshi Bhalawashi platform, which Nihat Kabir mentioned. Mm, and uh, while I'm very proud to be a part of that journey, we faced some serious challenges initially. Uh, I'll just give you a few figures, uh, just to give you an idea about the bigger picture. We started the uh, platform with 60 vendors, and 12 of them were male, 38 were female. And out of the 12 males, only four were over the age of 40, who had smartphones and internet, but didn't do anything useful with it. And then eight uh, of the other males were under 40, who were very tech savvy, they use Facebook and everything. Now out of the uh, 48 female, 12 women were over the age of 40, who never had smartphones or internet. And when I asked them why, they simply said, I just use my husband's phone or my son's phone when I need it. Husband did it to So, uh, and then the other uh, 36 women who are under the age of 40, mostly in their 20s and 30s, uh, they had smartphones, but not internet. Again, they would use their father's or brother's phone uh, or husband's uh, phone for mobile data. So uh, when we designed the training program for them, we had to incorporate all these aspects into it. And by the end of uh, July 2020, a lot of our vendors were uh, worried that their stock will be spoiled because of the rain and because of the humidity. So then we also came up with the diversification training. And there's a reason why I'm sharing all these stories. We have a, uh, one of our entrepreneurs, uh, I think Meghna is here. Meghna, can you please stand up? So uh, Meghna here, she's the proprietor of Rafia's Fashion. She started making uh, beautiful handbags out of Jamdani saris, which were actually spoiling due to the rain and humidity. And she's uh, carrying one of those bags here. Um, and then we have another entrepreneur uh, from Shilpolok, who makes uh, notebooks out of Nokshi Katha uh, bed sheets and all that. So uh, these are fast selling items and these are um, easy to sell, they're cost effective, and also for scaling up, these are good products. So um, the point here is that the training, please, you can sit down. Uh, the training was designed to meet the needs of our vendors and we also did uh, some research to assess the demands from the customers and we tried to do a matchmaking between the two. And that's why the platform was successful. And I think there's a lot of potentials for investors to invest in uh, training centers where they can offer customized uh, or need-based training for entrepreneurs. And it would be great if uh, Beza and Bebza, they allocate a land for women entrepreneurs where investors can come and set up training centers and uh, do the need-based training, uh, produce beautiful handmade products and export them worldwide. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a very inspiring uh, stories and your, your colleagues here who, who were here. Um, while we were told um, you can't actually teach someone to be an entrepreneur, you can't make that, but you can certainly teach them how to monetize their entrepreneurship and how to make a business out of it, yes. successful business out of it. I will now go to uh, Mr. Baba Dollar and ask her again uh, the question uh, that how can women entrepreneurs and workers take advantage of Bangladesh's transition towards digital economy? I just find this a very important question to be answered now because we don't want to be left behind again. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, wonderful to see everyone here. I hope you're enjoying the discussion. I really enjoyed the keynote speech. Uh, that was quite thought-provoking. And um, of course, the other panelist has already spoken. 
Um, I just, I'm sure for the last three days, all of you have been hearing a lot about Smart Bangladesh Vision, about the four pillars under Smart Bangladesh Vision. I think Smart Bangladesh uh, Vision 2041 is not just about futuristic Bangladesh. It's not just about connected citizen. It's not just about uh, cashless society. I think it has a lot to do, do uh, and a lot more to do about being inclusive and empowering every citizen in Bangladesh. And that's where majority of our population, 50% of our population is women, and that's where they actually come in. And it's important for us to really acknowledge that aspect and see what are we doing with this uh, huge dividend that we have, 50% of the population. If you look at digital economy, I'm sure we all understand what is digital economy or smart economy, but I think predominantly what it does is it creates opportunity and uh, efficiencies by utilizing broad range of economic activities uh, with the use of ICT and digital tools. And that's why we have to see how we can really make use of digital technology and enhance digital economy. And by far we have seen that there's ample evidence that digital economy actually significantly impacts uh, job creation in innovation and of course in economic growth. Coming back to women, you touched upon it about technology, how it's leapfrogging and how we are adopting it so fast. If you really look at the history, the first, second, and the third uh, industrial revolution, women were largely excluded from there, uh, leading um, actually economic domination by men for about two centuries. But the good news is the fourth industrial revolution is happening now, and the foundation is digital, and it's being laid out right now. So the absence of women now would actually impose a major threat if we want to close the digital divide um, uh, in the 21st century. Looking into that, there's a, a report that was uh, published by McKinsey, and they stated that if we were to just imagine that women had equal economic parity as men, then women would be contributing about $28 trillion into the global GDP. Can you imagine? That's the extent of, of economic uh, contribution that women can make. If we just look at Bangladesh and look at employment, we see that 36% of women are actually, uh, the rate of female employment is 36%, and the rate of male employment is about 87%. Okay, that's the difference. And if we increase just 1% female employment, they would contribute about $11.3 billion into our GDP. So that's huge, huge contribution of women. So I'd like to talk more about how women are contributing already. And going forward, if you really look at what are the major barriers to such inclusion and to bring more women into the economy, then there are three things that I would like to highlight. One thing is, of course, the digital divide that we have, the digital gender divide. It's, we often talk about internet penetration. We have heard that we have almost 100 million people who have access to internet. Is that enough? There are three ways that uh, divides are happening. One is, of course, access divide, then utilization divide, and the quality of usage is also very important. It's not only about access. I remember during pandemic, I've heard stories that a family having just smartphone, and then the children, maybe a daughter and a son, needed to have access to the smart device for e-learning, and that smart device went to who, can you guess? Of course, that went to the boy, to the son. So there's a huge, huge issue that we are actually dealing with, which is the mindset, and that's at the family level. We really need to teach them and make them understand that what those women can actually do for their family, for the society, and for the country, if we can give them equal opportunity. And that's where we need to really focus. The other thing is, of course, apart from the digital gender divide that we talk about, is diversification of women entrepreneurs. We have talked about F-commerce, M-commerce, E-commerce. There are, uh, Shomiapa is here, there are about 2,500 websites which are now run by women. There was an increase of 70% of businesses uh, during the pandemic, you know? So that really created a lot of, um, I think, impact when it comes to digital inclusion and having women into it. I'll just take one more minute and, and finish this. We really need to diversify now, not only M-commerce, F-commerce, why not have more startup owners, tech-based startup owners, why not consider e-agro, e-health, e-education, and bring them on board. 
And that brings me to the digital literacy part, which is a very, very major area where we have to really develop skills. Uh, Sonia Pa touched upon the fact that majority of the women don't even know how to use a smartphone. They have basic feature phones. The, those who have access to a smartphone don't know how to really make use of that. We really have to focus on how they make use of the content and how they can even generate income through you know, uh, uh, building up and developing contents. These are the three areas I think if we can focus, uh, and uh, of course including the policies that we have. I think we ha already have a very good platform and infrastructure built in Bangladesh with uh, the digital Bangladesh vision that we have had uh, until 2021. I think uh, we're all uh, good to expand and enhance our digital economy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca. That's a very eloquent exposition on, on the topic. I think uh, what we're seeing now is that our school curricula are being redesigned, remodeled. And I see the uh, former basis chairman is in the audience also here. Um, we need to push for digital literacy to be a very main part of uh, the curricula for children, literally from day one in school that should be very much a part of, of the curriculum. Um, I, I have uh, with us today uh, Ms. Nicole Mao, and I'm going to give a little bit more of an introduction to her than I have to the other three ladies here, because um, Nicole is, um, is a very innovative young female business leader and sustainably ad a sustainability advocate. Uh, she's a graduate of Harvard Business School and the Harvard Kennedy School. And she's the founder and CEO of Tiger New Energy, the leading renewable energy company and the first battery swapping provider in Bangladesh. Her company aims to accelerate the transition to clean energy by providing sustainable, innovative, and affordable solutions. Um, Nicole, I want to ask you, what made you come and invest in Bangladesh? Yes, I think I'm a good person to speak on this topic because two years ago I invested, I become investor of Bangladesh myself. I invest my, <laughs> thank you. I, I invest my time and the money here. And after two years, I become an advocate for Bangladesh because I want to attract more investors to Bangladesh. And uh, for a selfish reason to invest in me, my company and my vision of sustainability. And I have been talking with 40 foreign investors. So for the, uh, so over the 50 pitch presentations, you know, what's the first question they ever asked me? And no exception, it's always the first question as Nicole. Um, now you have two Harvard degrees and you have past working experience from BCG. So basically you can go to anywhere in the world. Why Bangladesh? And my answer is always, why not? Why not Bangladesh? There are three reasons. I really think it's a good place that every investor and every young talent should come to Bangladesh. And firstly, it's a good market. So when I study uh, which company, uh, which country I want to go after graduation, I took a very nerdy approach because I was a management consultant before. So I look at uh, the macroeconomic data for all the emerging countries uh, in Southeast Asia and South Asia. And I find a surprising place called Bangladesh with a such sizable population of 160 million and all very young. And it's a very sizable economy. The size is just a little bit behind Indonesia, but ahead of Vietnam. And this sizable um, economy growing at a very fast state of six or seven percent. And this is a, and it didn't, this makes me very curious. This is the place, this is a country I never heard. And I want to make a visit to see how is this sizable economy grow um, in real place. So I come to Bangladesh, I'm really um, surprised of, it's not just the economy here, it's all the people here are very passionate as we see in the, in, the, in the video before, it's the people young with passion and also with strong entrepreneurship. So like this is the place that I wanna invest in my future here. And also I believe now this has even more potential with the PM's um, great ambition of small economy. 
I think now I'm saying this is even more convincing than, um, than when I said this two years ago. Because now my com what my company has achieved in these two years, I think 80% goes to how good the company is, and we only take 20. How, how good the country is, how fast um, the economy is growing, and we only take 20% of how good we are. <laughs> and secondly, I really believe that um, there's great potential of the um, industry that I work um, as sustainability and the clean tech has great potential in Bangladesh. Before, when we talk about clean, um, clean technology, we always think about developing countries like US and EU. However, we believe that countries like Bangladesh, when, e when the economy is growing at a, such a fa fast rate, there's a growing rate for clean energy and sustainability as well. So, for example, countries like China make a huge mistake in sacrificing sustainability and environment for economic growth. Now the country is trying very hard to pay this back. We already see these mistakes. I think countries like um, Bangladesh, now we grow, we see the mistakes other countries making, we don't need to make the same mistake. We can grow in a more sustainable way. So that's why I think um, the sector I work specifically has great potential here. And uh, lastly, it's a little bit emotional reason. Um, like as a girl um, in China, it's also, um, people always tell you like, okay, girls uh, should be care givers, should not be in business. Girls are not good at math, so should not be in tech. <laughs> Girls are not ambitious enough, so should not be leaders. And uh, I want to break those um, stereotypes, and I want to show them that we can do it. Thank you, Nicole. I think from here, we are appointing you the brand ambassador for Bangladesh, <laughs> and for women in Bangladesh. I would like to take this through. Yes. Uh, what, what a brilliant introduction to Bangladesh, even to us, you know, from the eye of the outsider. And in Bangladesh, one of our biggest assets, if not our biggest asset, is our people. And it is absolutely high time that much more investment went into 50% of that asset. Rupali, I'm going to come back to you with a short question. Um, you and I have been um, at the other side of the table from the government for many years on policy frameworks. So, how can Bangladesh's f policy framework better support growth of women-owned businesses? I know you can write a thesis on it, we can write a few books on it, but a few points, please. Okay, um, first of all, uh, we, we, uh, when we spoke to regulators about it, you know, about the um, uh, eligibility of women uh, to get the loan, so it was actually for, uh, for women, it was always collateral base. So we actually fought with the government. Now uh, the allowable limit is 25 lakh and you don't need any collateral. But the problem is, you know, the SMA story, I think everybody knows that there has been a lot of talk about uh, SMA in general, men or women. So only 30 percent, you know, they are actually uh, working with the bank. And because of the because of the lot of paperwork, we have to really train our women. They know the business, you know, knowing the business, know your product. It, we have to actually teach them how to actually do the business, scale it up. Scaling up is very, very difficult. You know, you know, you want to do uh, one million pack of business, that is possible. When you have to build an organization, apni jokhon ekta organization build korben, tokhon ki kore korben. Apni jodi ekta babshar ROI toiri korte hoy, you have to look at the revenue, sales dekhtohabe, khoroch dekhtohabe, like the way a mudir dukan does his accounting. So we need to actually teach them accounting and to scale it up. And actually, amar amar jodin manush ke amake hire korte hoy, what's going to be the overhead cost? Eter ami kikore ami koto ami jodi bikri korle amar e overhead cost ta uthe ashbe. So this type of you know entrepreneurship skill and we need to actually you know give them and that cannot be done you know only by one organization i think all the private sectors are, are involved in it but you know our our efforts what i think in bangladesh are actually very much you know um, how fragmented it's not concerted someone is doing something and there is a, a to i and they are doing something 
there is another agency doing something else. So I don't see synchronization of all the efforts for, for the men also. I mean, I'm talking not only talking about the women. So women are actually left out all the time. So my sense is that, you know, women basically in, as a society, we have to think we have to really change the mindset of the people. They are the actually normal human being. Gender does not define them. So, we have to really change the mindset of the people. They are the normal human being. So, we need actually bigger, 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 bigger change in the, in the mindset of, of not only women, and also the men. And men, they are play a very, very good role when they are father, and when they are actually husband, they become something else, you know. So, uh, so I think that change of the mindset is also a very, very, uh, you know, initial point for this. Thank you. Thank you, Rupali. Um, if I can just carry on from what you said, access to finance, and Matasha, I'm going to come to you next with that question. I've been, uh, I sat on the board of Bragg Bank for, I think, 14 years. And it's one of the banks where non-collateralized small loans used to make up 50% of its portfolio. Even then, out of that, only 4% were women. Despite the best efforts, I have to say, of the Bragg Bank board and management. Uh, so we really need to work on that. Coming to you, Matesha, in that case, um, how, uh, how have you found in your experience uh, what what are the challenges in, in, in uh, accessing finance? I think we know most of the challenges. The question should be, how do we get out of it? Um, thank you for the question. In fact, Rupali Appa covered a lot of it. Uh, but in my experience with the SMEs, I've seen that uh, the recovery rate from women-led SMEs is over 98%. So if women are so good at repaying their loans, what is actually preventing the banks from giving them that loan that they deserve or they need to set up a business or scale up? Um, and I feel that it's not always the bank's reservation or uh, gender discrimination. It's also because, like Rupali Appa said, most banks operate in cities and towns, and the women living in remote or rural areas will have to travel to a local town which is probably a little far from her house, uh, to f you know, submit the application and uh, follow up on the um, progress. So she'll have to travel to the bank branch a few times. And if she travels there, then who's going to look after her house? Who's going to look after the children? And there's so many other things. So it's also definitely the mindset. Uh, there's a problem with the mindset. And I've also seen the opposite picture, where a man, a supportive husband, is actually helping his wife uh, to go to work or to go to the bank, and he's looking after uh, his house, which is also his responsibility. And then the society would look down on him and say, oh, he's a ghar jamai, or you know, he's sitting at home doing nothing. So even may men have to face those problems. So really, there has to be a change in the mindset. And the second thing is, I've seen that a lot of women entrepreneurs um, are kind of reluctant to give the proper papers like trade license, TIN number, uh, you know, uh, tax registration, uh, because they get harassed by uh, the customs department. So that is another problem that uh, prevents them from getting uh, bank loans. Um, now, going forward, I think um, there's a lot of women in the informal sector. Most of them are actually in the informal sector, and I think just over 30% of our uh, total bank account holders are women. Uh, which is a very low number, but still above the regional average. Um, so that's, that number is not enough. And if we want to include the uh, women in the informal sector, I think fintech is a good option. Uh, most women you know, who are in business have at least a Bikash account or a Nogod account, if not a bank account. So we can, uh, I think there's also investment opportunities in, in those sectors. And if um, fintech products for women with a savings scheme uh, can be introduced, I think that would be very helpful for them. Thank you. Thank you, Matish. Yes, uh, fintech certainly is, uh, is a way forward for reaching uh, the financial services to unbanked or non-banked women. Uh, final question for you, Rubaba, is um, how can women entrepreneurs in Bangladesh leverage uh, e-commerce platforms? 
Um, I think uh, I'll make it very short. I think we all understand and we have all witnessed uh, the utilization of e-commerce platforms, especially post-pandemic. I think many of us who are sitting here have al already gotten into that um, habit of using e-commerce platform ourselves as buyers. And uh, um, uh, just to talk about three advantages of e-commerce platform, one would be, of course, it lowers the barrier to entry. Because if you were to set up a store, a brick and mortar you know, uh, platform, then you would have to uh, have capital expenditure, have to have uh, ample uh, fund. But when it comes to e-commerce, if you really just have a general understanding of how to use these platforms, then I believe it becomes much easier for women, especially, to um, access e-commerce and provide their products and services. And it's not limited to only towns, and, and, and it can actually expand across Bangladesh, across various districts. So one is, of course, the lowering of entry barrier for women. The second part is uh, enhancing their access to customers. It's not only limited to Bangladesh or one particular location, it actually helps you to expand your business beyond Bangladesh. And I think that's what we need to also uh, nurture our e-commerce uh, you know, owners and, and uh, service providers so that they go beyond Bangladesh so we can also promote our uh, products and services outside of Bangladesh. The other third thing that I have noticed is, of course, it provides a lot of flexibility in terms of time and location. You know, I launched a telemedicine platform in 2018, and during pandemic, there were many female doctors who wanted to make use of this platform to be able to provide their consultation and service to their patient. There were many patients, female, who actually registered themselves so that they can get access to doctors online. This is how they're making use of this. So there's a lot of flexibility with regard to location. It doesn't matter where you are situated, you can get access to the service that you want. The other thing is there are many women who are probably caregivers or young mothers or have mobility constraints. And for them, e-commerce actually gives that huge uh, you know, uh, advantage and benefit for being able to just be flexible. I remember when we were working for over 25 years now in ICT, I've always heard every woman saying that I wish I, I had flexible hours. I wish I could work from home. And this hybrid culture that we are working now in, isn't that what we all wanted? I know at no. first we were complaining that it's a lot of pressure working from home and looking after, you know, uh, doing the daily chores and all that. But it's actually an advantage. And if you can really plan it, structure it well, then that actually gives you a lot of leeway and that, that advantage. So I think, in short, those are the three things I think we can really focus and expand when it comes to e-commerce uh, expansion. Excellent. Thank you. And this, this last point that, yes, it gives I, a lot I of I just have one request to Nihad, because she is the barrister, you know, that. <laughs> so I have only one thing, actually. Uh, when we talk about empowering women, we actually, the recognition from the family is that about the inheritance law. About? Inheritance. About the inheritance law, about the property. So, you know, it is actually, when it is a question, it's a Sharia law. When it is a property, it is a Sharia law. For the, you know, um, um, minority group, there is no law. They are not entitled to any property from the father. So we have to really change the mindset of that, you know, we are like a you know, lesser human being. So that has to be changed. Then everything will fall into a part. And I know that women are taking, you know, that as a challenge and they are going forward. But you also have a responsibility. <laughs> I know. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, it's on. Yes, uh, regarding the inheritance laws and regarding the different religious denominations and people who have not for one day practiced their religion become ultra-religious as soon as it comes to property, to marriage, to custody and all these uh, issues. But very recently you were talking about the minority communities, but we saw that when one group did come up with a draft to modify the law for inheritance, and to start organizing for that, there was an equal backlash from the same community saying that, no, we don't need it. And these are people trying to come and you know, make trouble within, uh, within ourselves. Society really needs to move on on this, and property laws need to be based upon the secular legal traditions which our country has espoused since independence. Um, it's, that's a very vexed and very long question. 
So let me go on to Nicole for your uh, second question. And after that, we'll have 10 minutes of questions and answers, if there are any, from the floor. Um, this is not, a, not uh, something directly related to investing in women, but generally to investing, which is, as somebody who has come to Bangladesh, bringing in the FDI, what would your advice be to foreign investors in coming to Bangladesh? And what would be your advice to us in how to attract more people like you? Yes, I, that remind me of a very interesting conversation um, that happened between me and my Chinese friends. They are in the investment field or they are um, wealthy uh, personals. Um, after one year, I'm in Bangladesh and go back to China. They asked me, Nicole, I hear all these good things you were talking about, um, about Bangladesh. It looks like a good place. So if I want to invest in Bangladesh, what's the most difficult thing that you think it would be for me? I said the most difficult thing that for you is you need to book the fly to Bangladesh. It's the most important first step and no one really take this first step to come and to see. Yeah. They only read news about Bangladesh and they, they, they heard from people, but when they come and they look at the people, they look at involvement, they don't need any more pitch decks. They are convinced already. So I think that's the first thing. Uh, so I think the, the business summit like this is definitely a great gateway to help people to, to bring more investors to Bangladesh and really to come and see. Another advice that I would have for foreign investors is to really um, make local friends. So firstly, it's, uh, it's definitely hard as a foreigner to understand the culture, the religion, and the business uh, written and unwritten rules. <laughs> And uh, all my friends, they actually helped me a lot. Once my business partner, our business partner, Newton Niloy, um, TBS, they are a reputable company here and they help us a lot. And uh, friends socially, I'm glad to know Matasha really helped me to bring this community to make friends, to, to help me understand um, the, the, the culture a lot. So make me feel like I'm a part of this community. Uh, so I definitely uh, think um, every foreign investor um, to make more friends here. Um, and uh, uh, lastly is to hire, uh, when, when they come, when they make business, to look at the broader industries. Traditionally, people come to Bangladesh investing um, government manufacturing uh, infrastructure. They are still good, they are still rising, but there are more things to look at when we're talking about a smart nation. Um, there are more opportunities coming up. So I, I think uh, investors can, can take a broader view of Bangladesh. Uh, and for advice, um, for um, Bangladeshi um, society or the government, I think the most important thing is, it's a such a good place, but I think Bangladesh people are very humble and not, not advertising it um, hard enough to make people know that it's a good place. So one's a good place, another is everyone knows that it's a good place. So I think um, more events like uh, like this will uh, will help to to bridge the, the information gap. Thank you very much. We will take good note of that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we've had a very interesting panel session. So let's put our hands together for our esteemed panelists. Thank you. If I may open the floor now for uh, any comments, questions. Uh, do we have anybody with a mic? Elmas, you don't get to speak first. I might let you speak later. <laughs> Please, Naza. Okay. Please introduce yourself. And uh... I am Naz Farhana, convener of uh, today's session, and um, I welcome everyone. I'm the president of Dhaka Women Chamber of Commerce and Industry. We empower women. It was such an interesting panelist discussion, and one of my favorite is Barrister Nihad Kabir. I would ask her, you know, like. Uh, being an entrepreneur and in, uh, looking after a few industries. And now the world is moving into fourth industrial revolution and the robotics. I'm just get, uh, having a wonder why everybody's getting so lazy, doing just TikTok, um, tech savvy, everybody's tech savvy. What 
about the, from the legal side, I want to ask you, uh, Niyadapa, how are we going to stop the cyber crime? And this is also affecting all the household, and not only that, even the laborers, and just seeing even all the, you know, I, sorry, excuse my language, buas or the maid and the drivers, they're, uh, you know, the bank, the carts, the coits, all are taking over. So, any discussion? Um, let, Thank let's, you so let's much. Move on. I thought being session chair it made me immune from questions, but, uh, and Nazapa's session convener couldn't ask questions, but neither of us seem to be following that rule. Um, Cybersecurity is a very big issue. Um, uh, and I think our regulators are now beginning to take note. And it's not just a question of cybersecurity, but also security in e-commerce transactions where the service provider or the good seller is not face-to-face -face with the uh, customer. So regulatory frameworks are being worked on. I can see the uh, ECAB chair here as well, and I know that uh, we are working together with the government and from FECCI and other chambers to come up with a strong regulatory framework for this uh, to protect. Um, let me welcome to our session the pres uh, president of FECCI, Mr. Mohammed Jashimuddin, the senior vice president, Mr. Mustafa Abu Kalam Azad, and uh, Mr. Alamgir, another director. Um, I have another a question at the back there. Hello. Hello, Assalamualaikum everyone. Uh, I'm Liana Jivan Raja, a final year student from BBA, Bangladesh University of Professionals. So I'm all aboard on the thinking that we have to change the society, uh, mind, so mindset of the society. But while changing it, I face a new problem, which is the blindness of the society. Like Miss Nicole said that the girls have been said that the girls can't do maths. So I said, give me maths and let's see if I can do or not or not. So when I did it, they said, ah, still, I don't believe you. Still, they don't want to believe that women can do it. Even after doing all these things, us women, they still don't want to accept us. So that blindness that, you know, that kind of stereotype or that kind of prejudice they have in their mind, it's really hard to, you know, change it. And that blindness stays in that mind. So how can we change that blindness? How can we remove that prejudice? Even after doing so much, even after seeing these great panels of women, still they don't do it. We've, we've, we've got your point. Rupali, I've Okay, I think, um, you know, the changing habits, changing faith, changing uh, mindset is the most difficult part. You know, there have been volumes of books written on changing habits. So we are talking about changing mindset. So I actually, we have been talking, I'm a maraki kurchi. Sharakun khali chale ke meke bolche tomar ki kora uchit ki kora uchit na. So now actually we have to tell our mothers what their sons have to do and what their sons have to, don't have to do. So ultimately that's the way I think the fundamental change from the family is going to come. And then we have to incentivize actually women. Now at the middle class they're sold to this idea that we, did, we play that role. Sometimes I'm a daughter, sometimes I'm a daughter-in-law, and my personality changes with the change of the role. So ultimately, the, you know, the middle class people, they understand that they have to educate their daughter because at the end of the day, when they grow old, it's only the daughters who are going to take care of them. I'm not really, no offense to the men, they take care of their mothers, I'm not saying that, but they cannot really balance between the wife and the mother. This, this is a serious problem of the world, not only Bangladesh. So ultimately, the, it will take you know, decades to change the society norms. We have to change ourselves. We have to understand that my you know, gender is not going to define me. I am a human being first, and then may my gender comes second. So if we can actually take that step first, everybody will change. You, we, the ch world is not going to change. We have to change ourselves, and world around us is, is going to change. Thank you, Rupali. I think, uh, Rubabe, you wanted to say something else? Yes, um, you actually started off by saying that, you know, they thought I will not be able to do maths. I said, give me maths, and then you, you were able to actually 
you know, make use of that. But then there was somebody saying that still you're not good enough. So my question back to you is that why do you need to get accepted by others? You know? What you're doing is you're doing it for yourself. Okay, you think of excelling, you think of pushing the bar and think how I can be better than what I was before. But how it, it really doesn't matter how others define you. So don't bother about what others are saying. You be focused on your vision and your goal. Assalamu alaikum. I am Nafiza from AIS Department, University of Dhaka. I have a question. What kind of steps private and public sectors have taken or taking for women's safety? For women's safety? Yeah. Security. Security is a fundamental issue for us. Okay. Can I take the dust? So actually you were talking about, you know, private sector taking the security of the woman. And private sectors, if you are talking about the corporations, individual company, they normally, they, if they have the capability, they provide transport. But security, providing security is, can never be the responsibility only for the private sector. Security of the country, security of the citizen is, has to be given by the government. Are they working private, together? The private sector can only play as enabler for the owner. Please allow the please allow the panelists to respond. Thank you. Aida, do you want to say anything else? But okay, um, to add on to what uh, Mr. Pali have Chaudhary said, the provision of security is first and foremost the responsibility of the state, and secondly the responsibility of society as a whole. And all of us as part of society, we bear that responsibility. Uh, in the corporate sector, there are rules, there are regulations, there are laws which are there. And in, uh, as part of their internal processes, some corporates provide more than that. But let me tell you, give you one example. Bangladesh Bank came up with a regulation that no woman would be allowed to stay in a bank branch beyond 6 p.m. No woman worker. Does that really help women? It helps some women, but it does not help all women who work in that sector. And ultimately, the responsibility for my safety and my security is mine. Ultimately, I need to be aware of what is going on and I need to ensure my security and not wait around for everybody else to do it also. So the state, the society and the individual all bear this responsibility. Any other query? Yes, please. There's one here. Um, we'll take two more questions. There's one in the front row and one at the back uh, there. Hello. Uh, good afternoon and assalamu alaikum. I'm Shahmina Ishamandan. I'm working as a gender specialist at the uh, USAID project. So my question to you is that we're discussing about smart economy and I would like to thank the panel for very interesting insights and the keynote presenter really focused on what can be done to integrate women. So my question to any one of the panel is that how do you think um, the, our regulatory environment, how conducive is it towards the participation of smart economy, towards improving the participation of women in the smart economy where we can see that in the rural levels children, I mean, especially girls, they do not know even how to, they don't know the difference between right click and left click of the mouse. And that is still prevalent. So how do you think, uh, what can be done? And what steps should the regulators take to make it more conducive for women to participate in the smart economy? Thank you. Um, as the keynote speaker mentioned that there, um, almost 100 million smartphone users in Bangladesh. Even uh, children are using smartphones these days. And um, a lot of uh, local offices, government offices and private sectors are also uh, giving training to uh, children uh, with computer skills. So I think that we will see the impact in, in a few years' time. Um, and uh, currently, um, also, I think Rubaba Dolor Nihat could be mentioned that from 50,000 F-commerce sites, now we have 300,000 uh, F-commerce sites, which is six times more in just, uh, in less than 
two years. So that's certainly a sign that uh, women are progressing in this field. Uh, however, we do need a lot of uh, other training, and uh, like, like I said earlier, need-based training uh, to teach what else you can do with your smartphone and not just you know, browsing Facebook or running um, an F-commerce page, but there's so many other things that you can do with a smartphone. Thank you. Let me add to this, I'm a lawyer. So any time anybody says regulations, my ears perk up. And as a lawyer, the less regulation there is, the better I like it. The less regulation there is, the more open, the more innovative society will be. It's not probably a question of regulation, but it's a question of policy, of positive enforcing policy from the government, of positively telling teachers to give girl children more time on the devices, of positively enforcing uh, the idea that women are perfectly good at maths and science, and in fact, the first computer programmer in the 1800s was actually a woman, not a man. Um, so those, those stories need to come forward in this. Um, a question at the back of the room? Yes, please. Hello, ma'am. Uh, I'm Pooja Shum, uh, Department of OSR from University of Dhaka. Uh, Ma'am, as we involve in education institutions, uh, I want to know that how can we prepare ourselves for the future economic development? Is there any kind of workshop or training that we can participate to make ourselves? Thank you. Uh, if I've understood your question right, you're asking that how can you get trainings on new advanced technologies? Is that what, you, what was your question? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, of course, there are many formal institutions who are providing training, but I think in this uh, uh, age of technology, you have access to a lot of information on the internet. That's where digital literacy also comes in. Anything you want to learn, you can actually learn it for free on internet. That's number one. Second is get yourself involved with various uh, voluntary work. Do part-time job. You know, your experience on the job is the best training that you can ever get. And when it comes to real technology, advanced technology, you really need to take those kind of formal trainings to really understand if you want to go deeper, you want to learn coding, uh, you know, you want to be a developer, then you really have to go through that formal training. There are many uh, programs being run by government nowadays, which are free, uh, of course, you need to enroll, and also various private institutions. Um, if you want, you can talk to me later and I'll give you more details about this. But I think first and foremost, be curious, and second is, you get a lot of information on the internet. Make sure that those are right content and correct information and just, just learn every day. There's something new that's happening and it's, technology is advancing so fast that things are changing rapidly. So it's important that you get um, you know, uh, connected to uh, information. Uh, during COVID period, you know, in our company when we could not send people outside for training, we use LinkedIn uh, no, uh, platform. So LinkedIn platform provide lot of training. So if you really, it's very easy. And I think YouTube is also a very good platform. So is Google. So ultimately, there are actually, as she said, so specifically, I could really name few. Um, I'm going to close the open session with one last intervention from Sayyid al Maskabir, who put his hand up first. Thank you. At last, uh, I get the equal opportunity. I'll just give you an insight. Um, I mean, I'll share an insight and two specific proposals. Um, in basis, we found out that the female participation in the ICT industry is very, very poor. Um, to be precise, it would be around in the, in the, in the vicinity of like 12 to 13% only in the ICT industry, even though almost 50% of our population is women. And uh, we all know that ICT is such an industry, this is actually very ideal for the women in our society because at the end of the day, if for whatever reason a woman has to stay at home, still that person, that woman can actually work on ICT with just a laptop and an internet connection. So this is the ideal, most ideal uh, career ca a woman can take in our society. So what we did in 2019, just before COVID, we actually had a few focus group discussion with the women in, in working in different IT companies. And we wanted to find out actually why the participation uh, is so low. 
what we found out is, and it was common in all the FGDs, amra onko bhoy pai. So the fear of math, what we discovered at the end of the, these, these discussions was actually instilled in their minds from the very, you know, childhood. So this is one thing, one barrier we must actually, you know, uh, cross before we can strategize so many other things and we can like, you know, put programming. Uh, in the uh, curriculum and so the STEM education, we have to encourage STEM education among the female uh, students. Number, this is the insight that I wanted to share. Two specific proposals. We really want to see a 10 year tax holiday for any women entrepreneur led venture. This will actually encourage female entrepreneurs, not only in the cities, actually in the remote parts. Number two is, you all know that uh, BSIC, they have a lot of premises and floor spaces that are actually unused. Those spaces, those floor spaces can be allocated to women entrepreneurs at a very nominal price, if not free. So these are the two proposals I just wanted to make. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that was very uh, insightful. And again, the stereotyping Onko um, bhai pai. You know, I uh, had science up to SSC, and when I went for HSC, I took arts but with maths. And I think my teachers' brains were rather short circuited. They're saying, Onko ijo di nibe tale science poro na kano. The fact that I didn't want to read biology and chemistry and physics, but I was rather good at maths, just didn't compute in their brains, I'm afraid. And um, this proposal about BISIC is, is very, very uh, interesting, and we will take note of it in our proceedings and put it forward um, at all fora. So I think, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we come to an end of what has been, uh, for me, a very interesting and exhilarating uh, session. And we are at the fag end of the Bangladesh Business Summit itself. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, my esteemed panelists, for your time. And stay well, be well, invest in Bangladesh, invest in women. You will not lose. You will be surprised by the results. Thank you. Good evening. Ladies Thank and you. gentlemen. Thank you, moderator. Ladies and gentlemen, now crest giving. I kindly request our session chair and moderator, Barrister Nihad Kirby to present the crest to our panelists. At first, Ms. Nicole Mao, Founder and Chief Executive Officer, Tiger New Energy. Ladies and gentlemen, round of applause. Next, Ms. Rubaba Dola, Country Managing Director, Bangladesh, Nepal and Bhutan, Oracle. Next, Ms. Rupali Hawk Choudhury, Managing Director, Barter Pains, Bangladesh Limited. <laughs> Next, Ms. Mantasha Ahmed, President, Association of Fashion Designers of Bangladesh, AFDB. I now kindly request Ms. Naz Farhana Ahmed, Director, FBCCI, and President Dhaka Women Chamber of Commerce and Industry to come to the stage and present the crest to our moderator and session chair, Barrister Nihad Kabir. Before giving, I want to really thank, a bit, I want to thank heartiest congratulations and thank you from the inner core, core of my heart for this wonderful session, for the wonderful panelists and the keynote speaker. And audience, thank you so much. And all my friends and directors and uh, all ladies and entrepreneurs, thank you so much for making this session so lively. Thank you so much. Now, photo session.
2041 সালে মধ্যে বাংলাদেশকে একটি উচ্চ আয়ের উন্নত সমৃদ্ধ এবং উদ্ভাবনী স্মার্ট বাংলাদেশ হিসেবে বিনির্মাণের জন্য আমাদের অভিযাত্রায় যুক্ত হতে উদাত্ত আহ্বান জানাচ্ছি Thank you everyone. This ends our session for today. Uh, FBCCI. It was a wonderful uh, gathering. Uh, to me, the inaugurations, it was really a very wonderful uh, uh, speech has been delivered by the key government person.